persons in committee meeting. Um, before we start the meeting, um, broadcast is on, Steve. Yeah. Okay. All right. <coughs> I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and we captured capable of subsequent repeated viewing with copies of the recording being made available for those that request it. By being present at this meeting, it's likely that the recording cameras will capture your image and this will result in your image becoming part of the broadcast. You should be aware that you may infringe your human and data protection rights if you have any concern that, pl that ple well, then please to be the webcasting officer. So item two is apologies for absence, and I understand we've got quite a few. Quite a few, Chairman. Uh, apologies from Councillors Jenning, Hadley, Rolf, Sartin, Stalker, Sunger, and Whitehouse. Have we missed anybody else? Tim Matthews had not turned up. Yeah. Councillor Heather. I would imagine oh. Councillor Stalker as well. He's normally in Spain. <laughs> <laughs> Right, moving on, um, declaration of interest, item three. Any declaration of interest? No? Any other business? No other business. No? Uh, Minister of the Licensing last <coughs> meeting on the um, 21st of March. That's on pages five to 10. Any comments from members? Okay, if you sign those as a correct record. Uh, item six is the minutes of the licensing subcommittees. Those who have chaired the meetings, if they could sign them. I think it's Councillor Pond and Councillor Keska. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you could sign them at the end of the meeting. Um, item seven, licensing statistics. Um, just to say that we did give this there in March. Um, you know, I'm licensing manager, Dave King. Do you want to say anything, Dave, regarding that? Uh, yes, Chair. Um, yes, so the com committee will recall that I gave the, an update on statistics for the, the year end back in March. That There is no real benefit by giving a mid-year uh, report, so I intend to give a full report at the licensing uh, committee next March, and then I'll be giving the figures for the full 12 months. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Any comments, members? Agree to that? Okay. Uh, item uh, eight is the payment licences. They're on page 11 and 12. Again, I'll hand over to uh, our manager, Dave. Thank you, Chair. So, Chair, th this, is, this is purely for information. Um, the committee will be aware that the, um, that the pavement licensing um, was introduced um, in response to the COVID pandemic, and it basically allowed uh, premises to apply for fast track licences to have tables and chairs outside their premises for the serving of, of food and drink. Um, under the levelling up and regeneration bill, it proposes to make that regime permanent. Now, um, that proposal uh, was meant to come into effect this year, however it's been postponed and it's still going through the parliamentary process. Um, in essence, the, the regime which first came into place um, in 2020, subsequently extended in 2021, and it's now been extended for a further year, the current process, until till next year. The bill proposes to make um, it a, pers a, a, a permanent fixture, and in, in doing so, it will allow councils to charge applicants uh, an increased fee. Currently, it's £100, but under the new proposal, they're looking to increase that to £350. Um, there are a number of changes as well that the, the bill proposes. I won't go through them all. Um, as I say, the, the current process is currently going through the parliamentary um, process in draft form. Uh, I will come back to the committee hopefully early next year with obviously the outcome of that, that process and hopefully with news that it will become a permanent fixture next summer. Thank you, Thank Chair. You. Any comments on the payment licences? Councillor Lyon first. Thank you, Chairman. Sorry to wreck the place. Um, yeah, I just um, happened to look at the website and I have to say that the application for pavement licences is very useful. So if anybody actually wants to apply, it's, it's, it's all there. That's something that I'm particularly keen to look at at the moment as far as the council is concerned, that our website is simple and easy to use. And I think that's one thing that I would say is, is quite useful. Just another comment on pavement licences. 
Are there any restrictions on the dimensions? Because I know that some of the pavement licenses that we have in Chigwell are very near the edge of the road or the edge of the footway, um, which can be a little bit problematic if people are sort of <coughs> driving uh, around parking areas and, and trying to park. So is there any restrictions or a template that can be used? Yeah, there are no restrictions as such. We do judge every, every application based on its own merits, and as you quite rightly say, obviously the, the public realm areas do tend to differ and some pavements are wider and would allow for more tables and chairs where others obviously don't. don't. So we do go through a consultation process with police and other colleagues. We do actually look at the area as well, and there is a kind of standard that we must maintain a certain amount of width to allow, obviously, passers-by. I'd gladly share that with you outside this meeting if you find that useful. Yes, please do. Yeah, just, just on that, is there any sort of review? Because I tend to see what's happening, that some of these licences that have been established for some time are drifting. So some of the actual license holders are sort of extending over and above where they were. So do we do a review? Are we looking at that sort of thing? So, yeah, so th we've... Re during the summer, because it's now been extended for another period, what we did was we wrote to all of our current licence holders. So there's only about 20. Um, there, there, there may appear more than that across the borough because some will have private forecourts that they can use and therefore they don't actually require a pavement licence. So, so it can be, be a bit misleading because you drive around, you'll see more premises and you think, well, hold on, we've only issued 20 licences. But, but that, that's the reason for that. So when we um, contacted our businesses this year, we advised them that this has been extended for a further period. And what we said to them, uh, similar to what we agreed last year, was that we would uh, extend it without fee as long as the dimensions, and it wasn't, it wasn't extended beyond that point. If there are any particular concerns regarding the premises, by all means, flag that for my service, and we'll certainly go down and make sure that they're within the footprint and the plan that we've granted the licence for. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Could I ask, I seem to remember that when this first came in, there was a difference in charge between a business having only one premises and having multiple premises. Can you just tell me, is that still the case? Was it ever the case? No, no, it was, it was never the case. But we were able to charge up to a maximum £100, um, and that, that's for, per licence. So if a company owns a number of restaurants or a number of chains across the borough and they apply for a pavement, pavement licence for each one, it's £100. OK. Any other questions on pavement licences? Right. Right. Um, item uh, 9 is the Live Music Act, pages 13 to 16. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So, so I thought this would be, the purpose of this report is actually just to, to give members an update on the exemptions that were introduced under the Live Music Act 2012 and the further deregulation uh, that come into effect in 2015. Now, I appreciate that was some time ago, but as you will see from the report, the number of exemptions and deregulation across the legislation is, is, is huge. So I thought it'd be good to produce a paper for committee um, to, to refer to and reflect on going forward. Now, Chair, I, I don't... Basically, under the Licensing Act, when it first came into effect, there was a number of exemptions that automatically applied to incidental music, Morris dancers, and, and various other exempt entertainment. It's all included in the report under page 13. Um, however, at the time, it was also felt by the music industry that the new Licensing Act was prohibitive, that the, um, the, the imposition of a licence and, and sometimes onerous conditions that were placed on them um, made it difficult for premises to continue to have live music and, and, and that obviously had the negative impact on our grassroots music industry. So after, after lobbying government, the DCMS conducted a review and following that review, the, license, uh, the Live Music Act 2012 came into effect. And that was shortly followed a couple of years later by the Legislative Reform um, Order 2014, which came into effect in April 2015. Now, that introduced a raft of key changes, and on page 14, I've, I've detailed them all there for, for the committee's information. Now, I don't intend to go through this, but what I would like to do today is to quickly go through the specific effect the deregulation has on our licensed premises, and in particular pubs, because this is something that comes up quite often, 
at our committee hearings. And it's when, live, and, and when a licence is required for the provision of live or recorded music and when it isn't. Um, under the deregulation, it removes the licensing requirements for live music and recorded music where there is a premises licence or club premise certificate in place permitting on sales. The premises are open for the sale or supply of alcohol for, cons for consumption on the premises. The live or recorded music is taking place between 8am and 11pm. If the music is amplified, live music or recorded music, e.g. for example DJs or discos, etc., the audience consists of no more than 500 people. As such, all premises that have an on-sale provision are automatically entitled to provide live or rec recorded music. Where there are existing conditions attached to a premises licence or club premise certificate that relate to live or recorded music, these are automatically dis disapplied and therefore the licence holder does not have to comply with them and they cannot be enforced by the licensing authority. For example, this would be the case where licences were granted prior to 2012 and they may have a number of conditions that have either been imposed by the committee or they offered up themselves in their application. The exemption applies to all areas that are shown on the plan attached to the premises licence, and this includes all outside areas, including beer gardens. If live ampl amplified music is taking place in an area not shown on the plans, again, for example, beer gardens, it's still not licensable due to the workplace exemption under the Act, and that's only between 8am and 11pm. The workplace exemption does not apply to recorded music. Now, the reason I'm drawing attention to this chair is quite often we will have premises, when they apply and they submit a plan with a premises licence, some may include the beer garden, but some don't. Now, technically, they don't have to include the beer garden um, on the plan when they, when they apply for a licence. However, just because that area is excluded, they, there is still another exemption that allows them to provide uh, live music outside. If the music is unamplified, live music providing it takes place between the hours of 8am and 11pm is also not licensable anywhere, regardless of the number of people in the audience. So these are, these are basically the, the conditions that apply. So any, any of our pubs, any of our, our premises that have on licences are automatically entitled to live or recorded music, irrespective of whether they've put that on the licence. I know that has come up at a few committee hearings. There are a number of protections that are in place for our local residents. For example, if a licence were to be reviewed, the licensing, can, the licensing authority can determine that the existing conditions on the premises licence that relate to live or recorded music will apply to that premises licence even between 8am and 11pm. If the premises licence, so if, if it doesn't include live and recorded music on there, the committee can actually disapply the exemption, forcing the premises to apply for a variation, at which point the committee can then attach uh, licence conditions. So if there's any questions on that, Chair, I'm happy to, to clarify. Okay, thank you. Um, I should have introduced you to start with as our new um, licensing portfolio holder. Welcome to our meeting. Any comments? We'd be pleased to hear from you. Um, you want to start now? Yes, please do, and then we'll um, cancel the Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you. Is there any is there any volume control that can be applied? I mean, it, they, they have the right to amplified music, but is there any limit to the amplification? No, there, no, there is no, um, there, there is no uh, limit on which uh, there's no conditions that, that are in place. Um, however, it doesn't mean they can cause a nuisance because there are other powers um, under, for example, the Environmental Protection Act 1990 um, that, that would apply. So, for example, if premises causing a nuisance, then we can take legal action, can serve a noise abatement notice on them, or ultimately we could review the licence and actually attach conditions to that licence or remove that exemption altogether. Okay. Right, Councillor Lyon. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, it's in conjunction with that. We had a, a recent case uh, of a pub which was in very close proximity to a residential area. In fact, probably less than about five metres away. Um, and that is a bit of a contentious issue. And it says that it's upon review of the licence. So the licence would be granted and it would have to be reviewed. It can't be 
agreed at that the original license um, hearing or, or license application. No, that, that, that's correct. So, so it, because of deregulation, so that there's an automatic entitlement, and the only way that entitlement can be removed or conditions can be attached is on review of the licence. Yeah, please do. So, and so there's no distance limitation either. So if it's right next door uh, with a family with young children, you know, even between 8 and 11, that could be quite a, a, a nuisance. No, I completely agree. So there is this mechanism for doing that. What I would say, Chair, is a lot of our premises, for example, if they have live and recorded music beyond 11 o'clock at night, that then becomes licensable, because this exemption only applies up to 11. And quite often, so when they apply and they're, they're going to have live music till midnight, for example, at weekends, they'll offer up a number of conditions in their application. My advice to license holders is, whilst we can't legally enforce these conditions during this period, it, I would consider it good management for you to follow those conditions. Even during the period between 8 o'clock and 11 o'clock, follow your conditions. Keep your windows and doors closed to avoid any unnecessary nuisance to your neighbours because otherwise potentially your licence could be reviewed and then you'll find yourself potentially having cut, hours cut back, losing the live music beyond 11 o'clock, having various conditions attached at that point. I think this is obviously going to cause some issues with, with licensing panels um, when licenses are granted or, or when um, people come in opposition. Uh, so I, I think we need to be aware of that when we're actually considering licenses and maybe explain that, that we're not in a position to uh, actually impose any conditions at that stage. I don't know how we can mitigate it, but we obviously need to be aware that there could be a problem. Have you any ideas? Yeah, if I can come back to you, that, that was the impetus actually for, for the report because I realised that, that that's not a criticism of the committee because this is very confusing and I constantly have to refer back to the exemptions and the reason I alluded to the workplace exemption in beer gardens is because that come up in a legal case and, and you think, well, actually, well, they may not be exempt because of that exemption, but there's probably another one that does exempt them from that activity. So it, it is confusing. I'll gladly work with the committee if you want on some wording uh, that could be used and certainly included at the outset. Uh, for example, uh, you know, certainly a couple of hearings that I've been at when I've been asked, I've explained the current situation. Um, potentially we could look to put something on the website, advising our residents that we could direct residents to. Um, again, drafting the report kind of succinctly puts that there. So the work's really been done. We may just need to kind of tailor that into a more, uh, a, a more kind of fluent guide and actually put that out for our residents. Maybe that would be of assistance. Okay, any other comments? Councillor Tesco. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Can I just say, I found this a very useful document. Um, it's put down in one place all of the various queries that we have uh, over and over again at um, licensing meetings. Uh, and it would be very useful to have either that or a slightly updated version available to everyone who sits on the licensing panels. Um, and also, it be, that is useful because it would allow us to directly advise residents and license application um, people as to what they can and can't do in advance and what the process is. So that's extremely useful. If you could, it does, I don't think it needs expanding, but if there's anything else you want to add to it, and we could, we could all, as panel members, have a copy, that would be excellent. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, that, thank you, Councillor. Yeah, that's very kind of you. That, that was the purpose of bringing that document together because the, all the information at the moment is in various different places because of different orders and different legislation. So I've condensed this into one form and I've shared this with my officers to make it easier when we get contacted by licensed premises as to, as to where the exemptions are. But thank you. Okay, any other comments? That one's just for information. We move on to our... Item 10, the um, road closures and street parties. And, you know, back in uh, last year, we had the, uh, the Lake Queen's um, Jubilee. Um, we'd like to have another one for our new king in uh, May. And I think, Dave, if you'd like to take us just through this, what's likely to happen and how we can 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. As, as the committee will recall, in March um, I brought a paper to committee. Um, we looked to simplify our road closure process to make it easier for local residents to apply for road closures to celebrate um, Her Majesty the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Um, that, that was approved. Um, it was a huge success, I'm glad, glad to report. So basically we, we waived the fee for last year. We reduced the six-week consultation period down to four. Um, we undertook the consultation with the relevant statutory authorities rather than the residents having to do it. We removed the, ne uh, the, necessary, uh, the necess necessity for road closure, uh, for risk assessments, for example. Overall, it was a, a massive success. We had a total of 47 applications um, this year and we closed, uh, we issued 45 road closures, which I believe is the highest that we've ever dealt with um, as, as a council. So, so it was a huge success. Uh, the feedback from residents has been, been very positive and I've included some of that in, in the report. Um, however, as you, you've alluded to, Chair, that following the sad passing of Her Majesty the Queen, um, it's now been confirmed that His Majesty King Charles III's coronation will take place on Saturday the 6th of May um, next year. At this time, we don't know if the preceding Friday or the following Monday will be a bank holiday. But irrespective of bank holiday or not, it is anticipated that residents will again be encouraged to celebrate um, the occasion. And accordingly, local authorities will be expected to make this process as, as easy as possible. Um, what, what I'd like to do, Chair, is given the success of the process adopted for Her Majesty the Queen's Jubilee, it is proposed that we adopt the same process again for His Majesty uh, King Charles III's coronation next year. So, and we adopt a simplified process. The reason I bring that to you now um, is because, certainly ahead of the Queen's Jubilee, we started to receive inquiries in the December of, of last year, and and we, we had to um, we, we had to defer those requests until we'd had a formal formal agreement. So, I'm hoping that we can get agreement in place. And then we'll just we'll just do the same process again. Okay. And how about the fee for the for next May? The fee will have to be a separate determination. Uh, currently, we charge two hundred two pounds for a road closure. I don't know if we can um, waive the fee in its entirety, but that that will be for further discussion. But certainly, we would look to um, do a simplified process again, just to make it as easy as possible for our residents to to apply for a, a road closure. Okay. Comments from anybody? Chair Francesca. Uh, well, I'm saying good things tonight, aren't I? Um, I? I think this is very useful again, and uh, let's hope that by having the simplified structure, we, we encourage residents to do this. Um, it, it does seem to me by doing that, you have taken most of the, the problems out of applications, because I'm, was, I did get a few inquiries. <laughs> <clears throat> and people were worried about the bureaucracy, but in the end, you managed to let, get most of it out of the way. And I think that that's a very good thing. And you should be, uh, uh, it should be noted that you've done it and we encourage you to do it again for next year. Do we need to have a formal decision at this committee? Or is it, uh, does it have to be proposed and seconded or what? Well, just for information, but um, Adrian will help us out, I think. Um, it's not been pr uh, put to you as a formal decision, so um, just a general agreement will do, I think. I don't think there's any dis uh, dissent in it. Okay. Any other comments? I, I would just add, Chair, it's likely we, we, we did receive um, letters from uh, uh, Michael Gove MP um, last year encouraging local authorities to, to make it as easy as possible for our residents to, to apply for road closures. We anticipate the government will take a similar stance this year as well. Okay. Right, we're well, moving on to uh, item 11 is the uh, taxi tariff. Uh, very comprehensive report from our manager. And uh, I'll let um, Dave King take over. Thank you, Chair. As, as the committee is aware, um, there has been no fair tariff um, increase since 2014. And taking in cons into consideration the current fuel prices, cost of living, inflation, um, Epping Forest District Council is, is now ranked 310th lowest nationally and the lowest locally when compared to other local authorities. The current fee tariff was sh originally scheduled to be part of a review 
of part of the, the wider taxi policy review. However, due to the, the ongoing and unprecedented fuel and cost of living increases, it has been necessary for us to bring this forward to support our licensed taxi trade. At the licensing committee in March, members were advised that following concerns expressed by the trade, the council's licensing team would undertake a review of taxi fares applied to customers using a hackney carriage within the district. That review has now been undertaken and the findings are contained within the report. In summary, fuel, pr uh, fuel prices, cost of living and inflation have increased significantly since 2014. Inflation reached 10.1% in July 2022, which is the highest since 1982. The Bank of England forecast is that it will increase to 11% in autumn. This is in part due to the increased fuel prices, where we have seen an approximate 44% increase in diesel and 42% increase in petrol since 2014. Benchmarking in March this year showed that based on an average two mile fare, Epping Forest District Council's tariff was the lowest in Essex and we were ranked 279th lowest nationwide out of 355 councils. Since the, since the benchmark in March, many local authorities increased their fees throughout the spring and the summer, and as such, further benchmarking exercise was undertaken in August. This benchmarking showed that we had fallen further behind and we were now ranked 310th lowest nationally and remained the lowest in Essex. Informal consultation has been undertaken with the trade earlier this year. However, the consultation was limited to those who had previously contacted us to request an increase. Whilst there is undoubtedly unanimous agreement within the trade that the current fee is far too low, we have re received little constructive feedback in terms of what that increase should be. However, one response suggested um, an increase, and, and this has been included as option four in the report. Epping Forest District Council's current tariff for a minimum daytime fare is, is three, £3.50 for the first mile, and 20 pence for each additional unit of 176 yards or part thereof. This equates to a fee of £5.50 for an average two mile fare. In my report, I provided four increased tariff options that the council may wish to consider. Option one, this would increase the tariff for the first mile across tariffs rates one, two, three and four by 75 pence and by an additional five pence for each additional unit of 176 yards or part thereof. This would increase the minimum daytime fare to £6.75 for an average two mile journey. This, uh, this option would make um, Epping Forest the sixth highest in Essex per two mile trip. Option two, this would increase the tariff for the first mile across tariffs, tariff rates one, two, three and four by 75 pence and buy 10, 10 pence for each additional unit of 176 yards or part thereof. This would increase the minimum daytime fare to £7.25 for an average two mile journey. This option would make Epping Forest tariff uh, the, uh, the fourth highest in Essex per two mile trip. The third option is to increase the tariff for the first mile across tariff rates one, two, three and four by one pound and buy a further 10 pence for each additional unit of 176 yards or part thereof. This would increase the minimum daytime fare to £7.50 for an average two mile journey. Again, this option would make Epping Forest tariff um, the fourth highest in Essex per two mile trip. The final option, Chair, option four, is the one that was suggested by the, by the trade. This would see an increase in the tariff for the first mile across rates one, two, three and four by £1.50 and by a further 30 pence for each additional unit of 176 yards or part thereof. This would increase the minimum daytime fare to eight pound for an average, for an average two mile journey. This option would make um, Epping Forest tariff the third highest in Essex per two mile trip. The full details of the options one to, one to four and the increase across all tariffs have been included in the report. Given that there has been no fair tar tariff increase since 2014 and taking into consideration current fuel prices, the cost of living, inflation and the council's low ranking, both nationally and locally compared with other local authorities, this is recommended that options one, two, three or four are now considered. 
My recommendation to the committee is that we should, we should be considering options two or three. <coughs> Previously, Epping Forest has opted to consult directly with the trade before a firm proposal is made. This, in my view, is a sensible option and promotes inclusive, inclusive, inclusivity with the trade and engagement. Once the committee has agreed the preferred option, I would suggest that we undertake consultation with the trade on that proposal, inviting comments before formal consultation commences. Once the, once the informal consultation has been undertaken, the Council can then consider the responses and determine how it wishes to proceed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that uh, very comprehensive report. Um, done a lot of work on this. Uh, members, comments? Councillor Lyon. Thank you, Chairman. Um, in the sort of benchmarking against other authorities, do we know when they raise their fees? So, because, I mean, if we're saying we're comparing ourselves with other authorities and they've set their fees a year or two years ago, they may be reviewing it and putting it up again. Or if it's been done fairly recently, then we may, may be right in terms of an assumption of where we should position ourselves. Do, do we have got a clue on, on how the other, others have done their tariff? We, we certainly know, we, we have some local authorities that have done it recently. As, as I say, I had to redo the benchmarking again in August this year because it had changed dramatically from, from March. So we know certainly, for example, South End, I think I've referred to in the report, um, they've introduced uh, a surcharge per mile of 40 pence, I believe it was. Um, there was other local authorities that have also reviewed it recently. Um, others haven't. Uh, but they're probably in the process of doing so. It, it, it's so fluid at the moment. Where we um, get our benchmarking information is um, we, we're contacted on a regular basis by the trade magazine where we all send our current fees off to and they actually compile a table. And so I constantly review that to see where we are both nationally and, and kind of lo locally. So whilst I wouldn't know all of the dates when, when local authorities introduced their fees last, uh, we do have a good, you know, good idea of how recent it was. Yeah, please, sir. Another question, really, and, and that relates to EV charging and, and moving people over to EV vehicles. Um, are any of these tariffs sort of taken that on board? And you know, would your recommendation between two and three actually help those drivers that want to move over to, to EV charging? <laughs> Yes, yeah, because it was such a detailed report, I, I didn't go through the report because I know the committee would have, have, would have had the opportunity to read through that. But I do make reference to the council's sustainability um, transport agenda and how it's one of the council's targets to, to get our taxi drivers to move over to electric vehicles. Now, there was a report done by, that, by one of my colleagues and it highlighted a number of barriers to that. And one, of course, is the cost. There's the infrastructure, there are other issues, the cost isn't the only thing, but the, the cost is prohibitive. And if our fees are so low, then obviously the affordability is, is, is questionable. So I have included in the report that if we see obviously an increase in fee tariff, we're likely to see an increase in electric vehicles, which at the moment are pretty much non-existent, um, to, to be honest, uh, across the counter. Other comments from members? Please do. Yes. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is not on the pricing. It's just that within your report, you make a suggestion that this is looked at automatically every 12 months in future, and I think that's a, an extremely good idea, and we should, we, we should agree with that straight away because we can't keep leaving it that it gets so bad the situation is... is uh, a, a, disastrous for our taxi drivers and then we have to make what looks like a huge increase this it should be quite automatic to review it every 12 months particularly at the moment yes no i agree chair as, as per my recommendation it should be reviewed at least 12 months or sometime sooner um, uh, the prices are fluctuating so it may be that we need to review them before then okay well members um which option would you like to propose we go with? Um, it's either two or three, I think. Probably, well, I'll leave you to suggest, but my option would be three. But Councillor uh, Lyon. Yeah, I, I think either two or three. I, I, I think, I mean, the, the, there's a sort of a balance here, isn't there, between 
what residents are going to have to pay and, and what we want to do to keep the, the business viable and encourage people to, to move over to more modern forms of transport. Um, and I, I think, on balance, I, I would go for option three, but maybe we should put it to the vote and, and see what people think. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Chair, if I can just clarify one point as well. Obviously, th this, is a, this is the, the tariff. What, with ta hackney carriage drivers, for example, they can agree a lower fare with their passengers should they want to do that. So if they have regular customers, for example, what they can't do is if we set the, tar the tariff at a certain level, they can't go beyond that, but they can agree to charge a, a lower tariff mm. uh, should, should they wish. I would also and, and, um, draw your attention to, back to the report I introduced in March, uh, when we looked at the statistics with the taxi drivers, um, back in March I highlighted that there was a 20% reduction in taxi drivers. So that's also a factor that we're losing obviously our taxi licence trade where they'll be going off and applying for licences in other areas where they can charge a higher tariff. So that should also be taken into consideration. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So can we have a proposal? Councillor Lyle, were you proposing option three? Certainly, I'm quite happy to propose option three. I think it's a balanced um, proposal and it, it reflects the sort of current costs that the drivers would have to experience and, and also is, is a reasonable price um, for the service, uh, considering that we've just heard that we're losing drivers as well. I think it's important that we, we try and improve the service to our drivers and to keep our residents on board. So, Councillor Kiska? Uh, I'm happy to second that. Okay. Are there any other um, proposals? If not, we'll put it to a vote. Those in favour of option three? Unanimous, Chairman. Okay. And also in there that we review it every year or sooner if necessary. Okay. Um, so we move on if that's all on the taxi uh, tariffs. And thank you again, uh, Dave, for your, all the work you put into that. It's taken a lot of work for you and uh, to get it where we are now. Okay, move on to uh, item 12, review of licensing subcommittee's procedures. Um, the only one uh, we did have was about staggering the um, meetings from one in the morning, one in the afternoon. Um, we had an email from our manager about this. Any comments, anybody? Uh, <laughs> it's, not, it's not a comment, but I'm about, to, uh, I'm about to chair, I think, my first staggered meeting in a week's time. So I'll, I'll let you know how it goes and uh, yeah. uh, whether we feel it, it is definitely an advantage. It would, it's, it's certainly an advantage for the applicant because they're not having to, to wait around for such a long time, because we can't tell how long some of the, some of the hearings are taking. Um, whether it means we are going to be sitting around for much longer, well, if it is, I think that's just part of the, uh, part of the requirement. Um, but as I say, my first one comes up in about a week's time. Actually, I think the, the two you've got next week will be about right, because the, both of them are not going to be five minute hearings, are they? They're going to take a while. So that should work out with those. And we'll just see how things go. I mean, if we have to review it, we will. Sorry, Any other Chair, comments Chair, on sorry, that? Sorry, Chair, if I can just come in on that as well. The, the, the part of the rationale behind that was, was we'd had a number of hearings, and for example, one um, where we had um, members of the public and, and not the applicant that were waiting for two and a half hours. Um, in my view, this is, this is avoidable. Um, I'm not suggesting that we set times at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. What I'm suggesting is that we take a best guesstimate. So, for example, we've got a couple of hearings coming up on the, the 8th of November uh, that I'll be attending next week. And so we can do the best guesstimate of how long they'll take. Um, certainly in terms of, of the applicant, the applicant, you know, obviously they're business people, so there's a cost to them being at hearings anyway. But also if they instruct a solicitor that charges by the hour, then you can have a solicitor sitting outside, obviously being paid for hours uh, before they've even spoken a word. I also don't think that the current system favours members, and I think we, you know, it, it's difficult for a member to commit to to multiple hearings when we don't know the timescales. So I think um, it's certainly um, 
it's something that we'd like to trial. There is no, there is no perfect way of doing this because we have no way at the outset of knowing how long a hearing is going to take. We can only use our experience to, to make a best, best kind of guess. Um, I would like to keep it under review, but then I think that that's how things should be anyway, that we keep them under constant review and, and we tinker with it and we change it if, if it doesn't work. But it would be good to get the members' feedback yes. as, as we go forward. So we'll wait Paul uh, to get his report. <laughs> uh, so, OK, if that's all on the licensing subcommittee procedures, then we're looking at that. We move on to the current and future training needs of the committee. Well, I think this depends on um, the May elections and there is any change in committee, we'll have a training after that. Can we agree to that? Okay. Um, item 14, matters arising. Huh? Any comments, um, portfolio holder? <laughs> um, thank you, Chair. I, I'd just like to, to endorse everything that's been said. I think it's a, a wonderful piece of work and it's, it was absolutely crystal clear. So uh, thank you and congratulations. Really good piece of work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there are no other matters arising, we move on to item 15, the date of the next meeting. Um, be marked sometime. It's, um, 22nd of March. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we'll have it at 7 p.m. because it's to work out better for everybody in the evening rather than <coughs> two o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, well, if there's no other business, thank you for your attendance and um, declare the meeting closed. Thank you, Jack.